So Jason is um, head of global sales and mobile sales for uh, and and uh, strategy at Google. So thank you for uh, coming. Uh, today we've been talking about how mobile is transforming education, uh, healthcare, the enterprise, uh, robots. What, what what is mobile? Like you know, what does it mean to you? You know, I listened to hi everybody. Uh, I listened to the last session. Uh, and I heard people debating about is it going to be a smartphone or heads up or this or that and everything else. And we've struggled with a lot of the same. Uh, and I would say we're six months into a pivot on this, which is the belief is that the form factor, that the hardware itself is actually not defining what is mobile because we see tablets being used in the home and we see smartphones being used in the home and we see large tablets. And I, I won't say the word that is P-H-A-B-L-E-T, uh, but I just reject the word. Uh, but the idea that the form factor has changed so dramatically, we're going to be in cars and everything. So our belief is that mobile is becoming a context, per aptly named uh, uh, section, uh, and, and that mobile is about when you're, when you're in a certain context, out and about, not in your home. Uh, because when you look at the behaviors on smartphones and tablets in the home, they're almost identical to the behaviors of tablets in the home, with the exceptions of all the cool stuff that was talked on this stage a minute ago. So we're increasingly seeing mobile as a context rather than as a, a hardware-driven phenomenon. So, so uh, you know, today there are sensors in the world, there's uh, wearable computers, there's innovation in database technology, and uh, increase in social data is doubling every uh, six months. Um, and some people talk about this, this digital overlay in the real world. What, what does that mean to you, and how does Google think about that? Well, we, we're paying a lot of attention to consumer behavior. Uh, and so everything, and everything you've heard about here is enabling the consumer and driving the consumer. Uh, and, and so, when we think about digital overlay in the physical world, it's the person who's connected standing in a store, or the person who's trying to find out the nutritional content of that meal they're about to buy, or the person who's trying to actually uh, find the place to eat that meal, and all the decisions we make on a daily basis, right? All of those are about digital overlay on each individual segment of our intelligence uh, and the decisions that we're making, whether that's a car or a pack of gum. Uh, and, and I think as you and I discussed sort of uh, before we walked out here, the idea that, as the previous group talked about, that there's some intelligence about I'm on my way home or I walk into my home and certain things automate, which is that the light bulb story is an automation story based on connectivity. It's actually not about smartphones. It's about connectivity and about geoposition and understanding that I'm in the room and having some kind of sensor for that. And so the idea that that connectivity, that the chipset and the cost of computing has come down so much that we can automate a whole bunch of things and it happens that many of those things are happening outside of the home is the macro change. Yeah, so, so uh, we talked about different verticals that are seeing disruption. And uh, we also talked a lot about uh, consumer behavior, consumerization of IT. Uh, consu are consumers like way ahead? Is business catching up? And you know, talk about how you think about that. My microphone is coming apart. So uh, a big part of sort of circa 2011, we spent a lot of energy at Google showing people the data the percentage of search queries, the percentage of YouTube queries, the percentage of Zagat and everything else that we see that was happening on these, these new devices. And I was still talking about devices. Um, 2012 was a transition year where a lot of people started to get it, but they didn't know what the heck to do. So we pivoted from why to how. And we spent a lot of energy helping the big Fortune 2000 advertisers down to the SMBs understand how these changes in consumer behavior were changing their need to invest. But I would say the vast majority of businesses, American and international, are not anywhere near where they need to be to engage the empowered, mobile, connected consumer. Uh, and with, with notable exceptions, uh, and we wave those exceptions around as often as we can, I think the idea is that businesses are chasing the consumer, and when they get to where the consumer is now, the consumer is going to be miles and miles ahead, or kilometers if you're international. <laughs> and, I, and I think that the idea that we're chasing the consumer is actually quite healthy, right? It means opportunity for all the entrepreneurs and for you as investors, uh, and it means that the, the, the huge businesses, the CMOs, the CIOs, all those folks, need to see the data to make the case. They need to see the case studies to understand the behavior, and they need somebody to model that behavior. And, and the role that we're trying to play, which ultimately feeds back into media and consumer adoption and better experiences, is helping Delta Airlines, and, and I don't mean to call them out because they're doing a great job, uh, just because I talked to them this morning, but helping absolutely everybody out there understand how to interpret this consumer behavior because it changes just about every brand I can think of's relationship with their customer. So every brand. So what are the, the key hot areas this next two years? Is it retail? Is it, uh, it going to be education? What do you think is, um, uh, who's waking up the fastest in business and, and, and driving forward? Well, you made it easy for me with the last part of it. Uh, I'll come back to what I think the key areas are. But with regard to who's waking up the fastest, I do think the folks that have been forced to it, are there any retailers in the room? Anybody run a physical retail store? Uh, your world has changed dramatically based on all of us being empowered as consumers. 
Not only the fact that we have maps to help figure out how to find that branch, which has dramatically changed needs assessment and, and needs fulfillment, but also the idea that when we're, people are in those stores, they can consult the internet, consult their friends. So retail is a story that's been told, that is in transformation. I think the venture investments have been made and we're starting to see the products that overlay that digital experience on the physical world to help retailers fight back. But I think that you're gonna see footprints of stores change. I think you're gonna see what um, uh, inventory stock change. I think that is a story that's been told. But I literally do not think there is a vertical out there. Healthcare is probably the slowest um, because of regulation. I don't think there's a vertical out there that, uh, that will not be transformed based on all of us being more empowered as consumers. And I was at an education event that Google threw last week, which is why I, I, I'll volunteer that as an example, although I think there are many. Uh, I had people from Apollo Group, which is uh, University of Phoenix, and DeVry and all these people challenging me and saying, the idea of proximity isn't important. Right? The idea that I know how far away I am from a set of known lat longs, whether that's airports or Starbucks or uh, Best Buy locations, that's really a retail thing. Maybe I could see why it's a car lot thing because Nissan targets people who are in uh, uh, Toyota lots or whatever it is, but it doesn't affect us in education. We're entirely online. And my view is that that's utterly wrong if you think about the idea of context. So over the period of uh, a couple of caffeinated beverages in about an hour, we had a conversation about you do cohort analysis out, the, out your ear uh, if you're Apollo Group, you understand that people acquired on Mondays are more valuable than people on Tuesdays or vice versa. How come you're not thinking about where people are when they're researching continuing for-profit education? How come you're not thinking about the role that location and time of day and the device that they're on and maybe the speed at which they're moving, all of those things impact which customer is engaging with your brand and what that customer wants back when they engage with your brand. So if you're eHarmony and you offer somebody, and I'm just using that as an example, if you offer somebody 64 fields to fill out, right? in the dating space to tell you what your perfect match is, and you're offering that to someone who is moving faster than two kilometers an hour in downtown Manhattan, you're making a massive mistake. They're not going to fill a form. Give them an experience they can consume in a short period of time before they catch the bus, before they arrive at their next appointment, that they can continue later. And that's the idea of context. The idea that you have this mix of these IP addresses that are walking around, which have report back, and you heard a lot about sensors in this last session, report back on where they are, what they're near, what's going on at a certain time of day, and then interpret that data, and then recast everything about your consumer experience based on understanding what that consumer wants from you in that moment. So, you know, I love going to breakfast, and I have this one breakfast place, they know me. So I'm walking the door, they know me. But uh, isn't it getting to be a little creepy when I go into some restaurant I don't know, and they, they start to know me? I mean, how do you, you uh, or is it that consumers are gonna start to expect that and actually enjoy that? So uh, when I walk into Best Buy, you know, I bought three flat screen TVs last year. Maybe uh, I, it would be nice to get noticed. What, what were do you, you doing think? with three flats? Anyway, <laughs> uh, I think I get where you're going with that, which is that, that there is there's a tension between personalization and privacy. Right. And, and there's so much more data, per my comment about location and all these other things, there's so much more data out there. And we as an industry are learning together what we can use and what we can't. Uh, and we're redefining and, and evolving is probably a better term. Uh, since Kim and Press are in the room, evolving our definition of privacy, right? Which is to understand with all this data available, what is fair game, what needs to be opt-in, and where do we need to ask permission to use that? I think as an industry, we need to define that uh, more precisely. We at Google are being exceptionally conservative on this, I think as we always are, which certainly creates opportunities for, for entrepreneurs. Um, I can say that I think that we already have um, uh, pieces of this, right? So in some of those retail environments where you bought those flat screen TVs, you may have a frequent shopper card. Right? You may have a salesperson that you know, you may have any number of things. So from a metaphor standpoint, we already are welcoming a lot of this into our lives. But we have to give the consumer the power over that relationship, whether they wanted to get that frequent shopper card, whether yeah. an affinity card or whatever yeah. it is, and put all of that power in the consumer's hands. I believe that the vast majority of consumers will want that level of personalization, will want that better experience that you see when we can take advantage of all that data, but not everyone will. So, so uh, you know, in our lives, uh, there are signature moments that have big impact on technology, this industry, this, uh, uh, this world. Uh, one of them was the iPhone. Changed the game, right? Completely changed the game. So what's going to be the next sig signature moment? Is it going to be uh, you know, Google Glass? Is it going to be uh, you know, uh, an Apple Watch? Uh, is it going to be Facebook Home? So I think, I think there will be hardware-driven ones and form factor ones. I think we'll have connectivity. I think we saw this with, with tablets and what tablets have done to, to desktop computing as well. I think you had one relatively recently when, when Netflix sort of spent a lot of money, Hollywood style, to produce something but didn't put it in a theater and didn't put it necessarily on TV. They launched that in an entirely different way because we have all these connected devices. That wouldn't have happened uh, 
for many reasons, because of Netflix evolution, but also because uh, of these devices. That wouldn't have happened years ago. So I think looking ahead, the fact that we're connected everywhere we go will enable lots of personalization. I'm not gonna name one specific event, um, because my general view is that, and at these events it's very fun, to look at the horizon and to think about the things that are coming. But the thing that excites me most about mobile is, is the now. My view is that all the things that we have now are transformative in the technologies that consumers are using today, and it's about all the entrepreneurs, as well as the Fortune 2000, taking advantage of that and delivering something as subtle as the fact that I can check in at my gate with a 3D barcode on my phone, rather than print something out, changing the entire experience as I walk through an airport. So I think it's the collection of all the little things that are capable now, and I don't want to let the future be the enemy of the now. Uh, you know, Google used to have a, a set period where you could have 20% of your time for innovation, uh, right? I mean, I think if that exists, I haven't found it. That it doesn't happen anymore. But but there's still a tremendous amount of innovation. VCs and, and investors are looking for the next big thing that has scale. That could be the next Google, the next Facebook. Um, but when entrepreneurs are, are doing things, is there enough room for innovation? Oh, Google's got that on their roadmap. Does that slow down innovation in the entrepreneurs? The, the, you and I sat together and watched what was going on in this stage, yeah. right? And, and all the innovation there, right? I would ask the people who, you know, the whatever number of hundreds of millions of people that use Snapchat every day, whether they feel that Google got in their way, right? And it's just one example that I would pick. Um, I think many people know, because the way Kim introduced me, my story is that I work for a, 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 a smaller company, AdMob, that competed directly in advertising. It wasn't in robots or connected home or, or, or pictures that disappear after six seconds. We were right in the, the square of, of Google's business, but we, we saw something in a very focused, very specialized way, right? We weren't setting out to beat Google, we were setting out to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. If you are focused on setting out to solve a problem and you understand that problem better than anyone on earth, right, then Google wants to be your partner, right? Google doesn't necessarily want to steal your business model. Google wants to uh, to be your partner, to understand what you know, and to figure out how that relates back. Because all those retailers and all those education companies and eHarmony that I referenced need all those entrepreneurial solutions to help them build these experiences. And Google's not going to build all that stuff, right? So we want all the innovation. The reason I show up at these things, we want all the innovation out there to solve the different parts of this problem. And I think there is a vast array of need uh, from these new consumers that are, that are so enabled. Great. Jason, I really, oh, the question right here. So just to repeat the question for presumably for the video is, is Google is doing certain things to understand and interpret context uh, based on search behavior or whatever else. Uh, how do we share that? How do we make that available? Um, to be completely honest, uh, we expose that uniformly uh, through APIs in Android to people who can call them uniformly, to our marketers through the AdWords front end, to people who come in and, and we're, we're getting better at exposing a lot of it. We had a big launch in February called Enhanced Campaigns which is actually about educating marketers how to take advantage of location, how to take advantage of all these things that I'm talking about. So we surface them. The thing that Google does is we don't go do a biz dev partnership. We tend to, to, to launch it either in a, in a platform way or as an API for, to allow people to develop. Um, but I also think there are a lot of people who have access to context that we don't. Uh, and, and I think that retailers are learning to understand the frequency by which people come into their stores. Movie theaters should be doing the same, as should quick serve restaurants, as should everybody out there. And so I think context is, uh, in some ways intentionally vague, right? Because I don't think we understand it yet. Um, but I think that, that there are people at the platform level who have it and who will expose it more and more over time, creating entrepreneurial opportunities. And based on all of your businesses, if you, I'm gonna use the example of the people who are on stage, if you're a connected home, you know a lot about a form of context, which is when I'm at home, right? That creates massive opportunity to build on top of that, to offer me experiences when I'm in that home that are tailored to the fact that I'm in the home as opposed to away. And so I think context is a term that will have to be defined for each business, but we're gonna do our best to surface it so there can be innovation on the Android platform, the Chrome platform, and on top of the ads platform. Great. Well, a round of applause for Jason. Thank you for coming. <laughs>